Uh, is it Mueller? Or... Yeah, I'm recording. Oh, hey, I'm Mueller. Are you Mueller? Are you also like letting people in the waiting room? Yep, I will be in charge of that. So, Dora um, is also has her PhD in the Department of Medieval Studies from Central European University in Budapest, where she was also a lecturer for a number of years. And she has recently accepted a job at Newcastle University. Not sure if I was supposed to say that or not, but uh, <laughs> but congratulations, Laura. But in the meantime, she's here, which is really exciting. Um, and so we are lucky to have her talk, which I think we can go ahead and pull that up now. So I can see the title because I don't have it. But... Entitled S Sustainable Solutions from the Margin, Earth House is a 20% increase Take it away, Dora. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, this paper is about earth building in Eastern Europe, and I will get back later to what I mean by earth building and Eastern Europe, and the different discourses around it, uh, specifically the relationship between the heritage discourse and the sustainability discourse. This is the topic of a new book project I am starting now. I have been dancing around this topic for several years now, uh, also, with the field experience or technical experience, and uh, I just realized recently that yes, this is a book project. So this is the outline about my talk for today. First, I will talk a bit about what is earth building, then how earth building is heritage, earth and architecture in Eastern Europe, and the and then I will move to the revival movement of earth and architecture. Then discuss the legal and policy context of this type of building and uh, then switch to the sustainability discourse and uh, generally the uh, discourse analysis uh, aspect. What's your plan for cement? This is a question from the new book by Bill Gates on how to avoid a climate disaster. He, he refers to cement as one of the main sources of the uh, present climate pro problem and uh, calls to for calls uh, to move towards a zero carbon uh, building construction industry and uh, earth building is one of the answer for that question that was your plan for the summer. Uh, earth building uh, covers a range of techniques uh, Adobe rammed earth. This is a modern rammed earth building, uh, I think in New Mexico or Texas. Uh, various cop techniques, earth combined with wood and earth combined with stone and brick. And there are also uh, like small architecture elements made of earth, like earth kilns, which uh, it's a separate topic. So I will first go through briefly these techniques because I'm not sure that everybody is familiar with what is what. Adobe is uh, basically it's sun dried but unburnt uh, brick, and uh, when it's done well, so it's it's clay and sand mixed with some straw or similar uh, organic material, and if it's done well, then it's as solid as concrete, but it's very sensitive for water. So if it gets wet, then it turns into mud again. Rammed earth is. Uh, uh, it, it's also an old technique, but uh, recently it has a revival in uh, modern design and construction in that industry. Basically, it's uh, like they they place two planks and then fill uh, the fill with earth in between, and then they hit it. Uh, traditionally, it was done manually, and now it's done with uh, uh, high performance machinery. So again, they can produce something that is really solid and durable and beautiful playing with these different layers. I love this. Cob building is another technique. Uh, cob is uh, clay and uh, sand mixed with straw again, but uh, they shape it with hand, so it can be different shapes. This is a simple way when they just create simple balls and they pile it up. But uh, there are in the Balkans, there are these really sophisticated techniques that they uh, create some kind of these triangular shapes, and the way they put them together, it's it's a bit like the uh, ancient Roman uh, technique of uh, clay architecture. So it's not necessarily simple the way it's done. And the, another technology of working with cob is when they pile it up, usually with these big forks, 
uh, and then cut cut down the two sides uh, after that. So uh, you can see on the top uh, on this archival photograph that the man is cutting it with a spade. My grandmother used to have such a house. And then earth is often combined with wood, either with uh, timber, then it's the, what is called in German fachwerk, and, uh, or it's also combined with the twigs, uh, like the um, wattle and oak technique on the left side. So it also uh, varies that how much is wood, how much is the earth that is used, it's usually clay. But uh, in this case, it's not the earth that bears the weight, but there is a solid structure made of wood and earth is the filling material. And also sometimes they combine it with reeds and then it's, uh, it's a different, like it's light uh, wall in uh, the Danube data, they use this technique that uh, because they build on um, artificial islands so the, and then it's light and it's not sinking. Uh, earth building uh, has been uh, done since the Neolithic times, so since the times that actually humans started to build uh, architecture, we know from archaeological excavations, and uh, it is it has been done all over the world, uh, basically where there is clay, sand, and water. Uh, in mountainous areas where there is wood or stone, uh, they prefer those materials, but still often they combine it with earth. Uh, simply, it's just easier to work with. Or they put the stone, so if they use uh, earth or clay as plaster uh, when building with stone. So there is a broad variety all over the world. Uh, there are also some examples of earth architecture, which are considered uh, among the great achievements of humankind. And they are listed as UNESCO World Heritage, such as this mosque uh, in Mali, Timbuktu. Uh, so UNESCO, there are, there are, I think, around 40 listed UNESCO World Heritage sites made of Earth all over the world. And UNESCO has a World Heritage Earth and Architecture Program, which focuses on the conservation of such buildings. Because, I mean, you can imagine that uh, for several hundred years to maintain such buildings, it's, it's a challenge how to do this, because it's, it's a... What is what makes it uh, zero carbon that uh, you use it as you find it and then it perishes and leaves no no uh, debris behind. This is also the disadvantage that it can just disappear. Uh, so this earth and ar uh, architecture uh, pro the conservation program of UNESCO it focuses mostly on South America, Africa, South Asia, Middle East, and also some parts of the Mediterranean uh, in Europe, but. Uh, earth building is a part of historical architecture in uh, Europe as well. Uh, just when we think about European architecture, this is not exactly the thing that we think about among the great achievements of uh, the humankind that lives in Europe. Uh, so we know from archaeological excavations from the prehistoric times in Europe and uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, it was widely applied and there are several buildings that uh, survive from the Middle, Age, Middle Ages. But earth building was promoted uh, on large scale from the 18th century, primarily within the Habsburg Empire and France, uh, but also within the Ottoman Empire for various reasons. First of all, that this was the time when they started to handle the issue of fire hazard in a centralized manner. And uh, this, so wood is, is much more, uh, it represents a much bigger fire hazard than earth. So th this is why they promote it. But also this is the period of uh, when, when they first started to feel the impact of large scale deforestation. So uh, also there was a lack of uh, wood in certain areas. So, um, So renders and adobe houses were considered as affordable, safe, and healthy living space. This is also important that this was considered as something healthy and uh, easy to clean uh, and easy to, to renew. In the Habsburg Empire, uh, master builders, also coming from France, they prepared the design and they were circulated in the form of treaties with drawings. So uh, it was also a strength centralized uh, way of system. So not just learning from practice, but it was a way to teach people, to educate them how to build uh, such houses. Uh, the bulk of uh, earthen architecture surviving in Europe is classified as vernacular architecture. And uh, 
uh, it consists of mostly of residential houses and farm buildings, and the majority is rural architecture. Uh, these buildings are uh, vulnerable to climatic factors, so they are considered as something to preserve as a vernacular heritage, and the experts uh, make efforts uh, how to conserve them. Uh, they are also considered as part of the national past, uh, so like folk architecture, so they are listed and presented. Uh, individual buildings are listed, uh, but there are also uh, roots of folk architecture, vernacular architecture, uh, landscape, uh, listed landscapes and ethnographic uh, museums. Ethnographic opener, ethnographic museums, uh, also called Skansens, they were first established in the 19th century Scandinavia, and then they became widespread in Europe. And this is a perfect way to displace this type of architecture, uh, vernacular architecture, and they are very popular in Central and Eastern Europe. So there are many of them in every country. Uh, they preserve the buildings either in situ, so the whole village is, an, is declared as a Skansen, or they, uh, it's more frequently, they move the uh, buildings that they select for preservation uh, to designated sites. So they create some kind of non-existing ideal village that represents the architecture of different regions of the nation, the country. Uh, and these uh, scansons present a sanitized and idealized way or, or idealized narrative of uh, folk architecture and rural life in general. So it looks like this uh, on the pictures. Uh, so earth building is featured as heritage in these forms that I just presented, but its presence is much broader in Europe, uh, though it's difficult to identify uh, because these are simply houses which are plastered and pe people live in them. You cannot see what it is made of. Besides archaeology and ethnography and architectural history, one can turn to housing statistics, usually made by states to survey the ha housing stock, uh, simply to understand that what are the living conditions of people. And in these cases, they uh, indicate the material of the houses, not in every country and not everywhere, but sometimes. Seismology, because earth buildings are uh, resistant to earthquakes, so seismologists are specifically interested in the building material of houses. I found great lists of uh, in seismology publications. And uh, recently, in inventories of the building stock from the perspective of energy efficiency, and I will get back to this discourse later. Uh, but in this case, in the latter case, it's not that much the building material, but the age of the buildings uh, that matters. So uh, based on the uh, period when the houses were, were built, it's possible to guess that uh, what might be the material. Uh, however, with the climate change, there is a widespread recognition of the favorable characteristics of these buildings. So earth is carbon zero material and thick earthworks have a high resistance against uh, to temperature, temperature change. So it's, it uh, does not insulate well but it takes a long time to, like when it gets warm outside, it keeps uh, cold inside, but then it gets warmer. But by that time in Central Europe, temperature changes again. So it's really comfortable in summer and also in winter, it's quite okay. Uh, and if insulated with proper materials, uh, this quality, quality can even be improved. Uh, so consequently, Earth building has been featured in the global green or eco architecture discourse since the 1970s. There are books uh, about these conferences organized, projects all over Europe, uh, and they also uh, mm, prepare surveys on on this the tradition of Earth architecture and the building stock. And there are experiments and uh, new constructions. Uh, but there is a more difficult question of what to do with the existing building stock. In most European countries, they stopped using these techniques after the Second World War, but Central and Eastern Europe is an exception. Uh, in, uh, this, this is, for example, from Hungary, 1997. It's a short documentary about Roma uh, preparing adobe bricks. And uh, also in Romania and the Danube, that uh, they still do this. So simply, this is the best material to use. Uh, so there, the, the there are very very few uh, situations where there is a continuity 
of uh, using these materials, but usually there are the buildings, then nobody does it anymore and everybody forgot how to do it, and then there is the rediscovery. Uh, so if looking at the rural building stock, uh, it's in Hungary and in Romania, it was done up to the 1970s in Bulgaria until the 1960s. So there was a continuous application of such te the techniques in Serbia before the 1950s for sure. Uh, so th the socialist construction industry was a, was a trend which uh, basically put a stop on uh, this tradition. Uh, but in Hungary, there was a, uh, it was demonstrated that there was a new increase from the 90s uh, in the application of earth due to the economic decline after the um, change of the system. So it, it uh, apparently it still works in certain places, but there are no good data about this. Uh, what, uh, what, I, what I found is that in Hungary, 14% uh, of the population lives in earthen buildings, which is talking in Romania. Uh, there are earthen buildings in two-thirds of rural settlements. And think about this, that the uh, large part of Romania is mountainous. So basically everywhere where uh, where they build uh, on the plain land. But in Moldova, it's uh, 60, 70, and somewhere even 80% of architecture is earth. In Serbia, it is mostly concentrated in Vojvodina. So one-third of the buildings mostly built before the Second World War. Uh, and there are also differences in the techniques, like in, in Vojvodina, it's uh, Adobe rammed earth, in Central Serbia rammed earth, Southeast and East Serbia wetland of techniques, so combined with tweaks. In, the, in the Bulgaria, I didn't find any data on uh, the number of buildings, the percentage, but it's popular, so there are many such buildings. And what is also interesting that in Albania and Bulgaria, there are uh, urban buildings, also two-story buildings made of uh, earth. Mm. It is common in these countries that earth houses are associated with poverty and social marginalization. Uh, in Poland, in Serbia, Hungary, Romania, Ukraine, Slovakia, this is the discourse. So often it also means uh, marginalized uh, or uh, disadvantaged ethnic communities like the Roma. There is another trend, however, that urban intellectuals buy such houses and they move uh, out from the cities in search of a more sustainable life lifestyle and they renovate such houses. This trend has been there for uh, two decades, the past two decades in all of these countries, so all Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, now comes the personal story. So we are, uh, with Vladimir, we are one of these people. So <laughs> it, was a, it was a COVID project that uh, we, want, we, we decided to, uh, to take this step and uh, we bought an old, this, is, this house was built in the 1930s and it has a big garden with old fruit trees. So uh, we, we decided to renovate uh, this house. Uh, the house was full of non-suitable materials uh, because earth buildings, they, the walls have to breathe. So uh, they, they uh, accumulate uh, some uh, humidity from below. And if you close down the surface of earth buildings, they, they, it, it just, okay. the, the water just gets stuck and the, the walls melt. They turn into mud. So if, if they use a modern uh, plaster containing cement or modern paints, or uh, Gibson, uh, then these buildings uh, get damaged, or if they cover the wall with uh, sheet, uh, sheet rock, 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 sheet yeah. rock, that's also uh, very bad. So in this house, everything was done. Luckily, it uh, it was so. There are different factors which can make the situation worse. Uh, luckily, in this case, there were not uh, huge damages in the house, uh, and. Uh, what, what was the interesting experience that we couldn't find anybody in the village who knew any of the, the, the suitable technologies or uh, the sources of local materials so where we can find suitable earth. Uh, not even those who were born there. Our neighbors, they are an old couple. The, they live there all their life and they don't know this. And uh, we... Uh, so basically, we learned what we knew through this revival movement, contacting other people and from literature. So I did research. And actually, I explained the neighbor, the old neighbor, uh, what is good and what is not good in terms of materials. 
Uh, so uh, those who do this kind of architecture in Hungary, who know they are all part of this revival movement, and there are also uh, some uh, people in the construction industry who know about this, but uh, well, you can book them, they cost a lot and they are available in two years. So this is not really an option for the 670,000 people who, <laughs> who own such houses and who belong to the social and the economic margins of the society. Uh, so what is the problem here? Uh, earth building generally, it's a community genre. So the way my grandmother's rendered house was built, that, that half of the village and the relatives, they came together and they prepared it. And they learn from each other how to do it, how to maintain it, where you can find the suitable materials. And uh, since the traditional social structures uh, were destroyed, they do not exist anymore. This uh, source of uh, knowledge transfer tradition, which is also heritage, this is the intangible heritage, uh, it's just gone. So what is left? The buildings themselves. So we talk about material heritage and the experts want to preserve the houses. But actually, the living part of it is just gone. Uh, so these are two different heritage discourses around Earth architecture. Um, so the revival movement uh, is is uh, it's an initiative that came from different directions, and and I'm not just talking about Hungary. I, I the same thing is happening in Serbia, in Romania. In, in, so in all these Bulgaria. countries, yeah, Bulgaria, yeah. yes. Uh, so there are architects who are interested in this architect in this material. They they uh, uh, on one hand they they redesign uh, the old houses. So this one, uh, for example, is a renovated old house. Uh, but they also this no, this is not this is a new house. So they also design new houses on the example of traditional architecture. So they connect to the heritage. Uh, this heritage is like a it's regional architecture, earth architecture, and uh, they they work with this but reconceptualize this. So it's another way of uh, looking at the heritage. Uh, but uh, there are also modern houses uh, designed with traditional technologies and materials. Again, a different way of working with earth building as heritage, working with the knowledge, the materials, uh, but not with the form. Uh, then there are there there are small enterprises, usually social enterprises, who produce modern materials, but these are based on the traditional raw materials. So if you don't want to dig for earth in your own uh, village, you can just buy it. It's expensive, but mm -hmm. but uh, these these uh, uh, entrepreneurs they are also really conscious about what they are doing and and they are part of this discourse and uh, they work together with the uh, architects and civic actors too uh, for example uh, this is an eco house this is also something uh, that is done uh, eco houses are built uh, by architects but also by by uh, just uh, civic actors non-professional enthusiasts this one is in Romania in the Banat Casa Verde, uh, it's built by Iliana Magrodin, who's an architect. Uh, and there are also several videos on YouTube about building and using such eco houses, so they are experiments. And this this comes with the, the idea of a different lifestyle, it's back to the nature and uh, living in uh, harmony with the nature. And then there are different organizations, uh, official and non official, so NGOs and just uh, bottom up communities courses, workshops, conferences, social media groups, uh, mostly or co-organized by professionals and non-professionals. Regio Earth is one of a uh, series of such events. It's uh, since 2017 in Serbia, Romania, and Hungary. And uh, it was combined with the Balkan Earth Conference in 2019. Uh, they they usually, uh, so they, they, do, they do not, just work with the material part of the heritage, but also the social community aspect. So they, they acknowledge that this is a community thing and they also work with the social revival around uh, the architecture. And uh, they also refer to heritage in their in the, in the words they use. So for our movement is called, for example, the house of my grandfather. So they very consciously connect to the past. Uh, So people uh, rediscover 
in the, in the individuals who are not connected to any of these groups, they rediscover the material, the old houses, the related lifestyle, and the power of community. Uh, and and the, the social and material side are always interlinked. Uh, this picture is from a movie called Stika. It's a Ukrainian documentary series. It's wonderful. And uh, so it's about national architecture now in the time of the war and how people connect to the architecture, what they think as national architecture in Ukraine. And uh, there are, so this this man is one from the uh, young Ukrainians who moved to the countryside from the cities to escape the uh, shelling. And uh, they they moved to the houses they inherited from their parents, grandparents, and which, ha which have been out of use for decades now. And they rediscover uh, these old earth buildings and the related lifestyle. They connect the local communities and uh, and this is a different conceptualization of national heritage. So this is not about protected buildings, but it is it is about living heritage. Mm -hmm. So how does it work in practice in terms of legislation and policies? Uh, the main policy framework uh, that uh, connects to earth, uh, earth building in Europe is the EU climate uh, goal which basically aims to uh, reach a zero car carbon building stock by 2050. So Earth architecture would fit perfectly in this aim, but uh, we saw that that uh, most of the buildings are existing buildings are old and uh, not really energy efficient. Uh, the aim uh, along this climate goal is to lower energy bills, to reduce energy poverty, boost the construction sector, and support local jobs. This is a uh, so this type of architecture uh, does not need production of materials. It, it, it's a it's a work intensive sector, so it needs human resources. So it would absolutely fit. And uh, if uh, if these houses were modernized with the right materials, uh, yeah, this would be a great way to move towards the uh, climate goal. There are national energy and climate plans uh, formulated a lot in EU member countries, formulated along these goals. And then it's the next question that what is in this? So how, how do they work with what they have locally there? Uh, they introduce the energy performance certificate for so every building. If you buy or sell a building, you need an expert who, who puts your building into a category. And uh, it's, it's A plus plus the maximum, and our house uh, was F. When we bought, <laughs> so and it's not it, it's not the word. So uh, this certificate it's basically suitable to 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 express that these buildings are just garbage. It, it's useless. Uh, there are long term national renovation strategies and there are financial tools uh, to cover these. And uh, I know about the Hungarian uh, case because I looked into that by now. And uh, First building is so uh, is not part of this strategy. So basically, they they declared that these are uh, non sustainable buildings and we should just get rid of them. Which means 1.4 million people, and uh, there is no so, so these these people are not eligible for any subsidized loans, any grants, nothing. Those people who live in protected earth building, they are uh, eligible for heritage uh, support, like some money. If they do the renovation the right way, but it's it's a it's it's a very little uh, minority. Uh, at national level, and now I'm not just focusing on EU member countries. There is no specific legislation on earth building like anywhere, any any uh, countries in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, they count as lightweight construction site structures, which means that uh, if you build a new building, you have to have a solid uh, structure, like timber work, uh, if it's the proper done the proper way, but it, usually they combine it with the reinforced concrete, uh, and then it just makes no sense. Uh, if it's also a question that whether you can just uh, query uh, materials, so you, you can just dig um, clay and sand in your own uh, garden, or how it works. In Hungary, it's taxable. So uh, there are uh, taxation regulation is also an area uh, that matters, and insurance requirements, 
In Romania now it's mandatory to insure every single building. And uh, it's a tricky thing whether um, now there is a framework to insure also the type of buildings, but it's it's a tricky thing that that uh, how it works and how much it costs because of course uh, they are high risk buildings. So this is a gray zone of uh, uh, building. And in Romania, if you go to such groups, for example, but in Serbia is the same. I know that that uh, they advise you just uh, not to get a building permission, but okay, you build your building. Nobody will notice it. Usually, these people do it somewhere in the edges of villages or in the forest. So it's it's a gray zone and it's kept as a gray zone. Uh, so uh, now I, I went through the heritage discourses and I touched up on the question of sustainability. So uh, I would like to bring together these uh, two discourses. And uh, when we talk about heritage, we can talk about sustainability in three ways. So how this is relevant. One is the sustainable management of heritage. What does it mean? You have a third building and uh, how you can keep it going, uh, how you can conserve it in a way that it doesn't cost too much money and uh, it is uh, it, it will not collapse and uh, yeah, the knowledge is somehow passed on. This is the very simple way of thinking about it. It's about the sustainability of the architecture. Or you can think about the sustainability of the knowledge and tradition, that how you, how are the structures where you pass on the knowledge and tradition. Then heritage as a repository of sustainable solutions. For example, if you think in terms of climate change, earth building is, is really a useful uh, set of uh, ideas that uh, these are good materials and uh, thick walls of the houses. So these people in the ancient times before the air conditioning systems, they knew how to keep their houses uh, cool and warm. So let's look at it and uh, let's uh, use this as a resource. And the third way is the most interesting how heritage can help us think in terms of sustainability. And the example of this Ukrainian man who who discovered uh, the old house of his grandfather and uh, started to think differently about uh, living in a community, living in harmony with the nature, and in general, uh, the uh, what do we pass on to future generations? So, uh, being in interaction with an old building and the traditions around it, he started to think differently about uh, sustainability. And uh, this is also uh, an interface of the two discourses. Uh, so heritage is is uh, is relevant if we look at the sustainable development goals. If you look at any of these goals, we can we can think about how earth building can help us working with earth building or thinking about it how it can help us move towards these goals. And it works. I mean, we have no time now to do this, but uh, it works. Uh, yes. So uh, I started with the saying that uh, this is a new book project for me, which I just started and. Uh, I research earth building in Central and Eastern Europe in order to identify the interwoven narratives of heritage and sustainability as now in the present and to understand how heritage can contribute to a better future as identified in terms of sustainable development, meaning uh, that uh, not to compromise the uh, future generations uh, possibilities or options uh, by our decisions made in the present. And uh, I still have some questions that I I, uh, I don't know how to uh, how to do how to sort out in this project, and I will I will tell them because maybe you can help me with it. Uh, one question is the like the major question is the geographical range uh, because in terms of earth building history uh, there are regions which are usually. Uh, the countries which are usually treated as a region like Poland is usually discussed with uh, Germany. And uh, Eastern Austria is discussed together with Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Romania. So this is the central area. And Serbia, Vojvodina. And uh, Bulgaria belongs to the East Mediterranean uh, because the traditions uh, reach that area from the uh, Near East. So it's a different direction. And uh, this uh, 
But this is different if I look at the present perceptions and practices of Earth architecture and also the legal and policy framework. And in that respect, EU member versus non-EU member is a big uh, difference. So to compare that, there is the sustainability discourse pushed in EU member countries uh, with this EU climate goal uh, in mind, but how does it happen in, in non-EU member countries? So, yeah, so obviously I cannot do everything, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm still pondering on how to, how to, uh, how to define my geographical uh, thing. And uh, also, I know that you know much more about certain countries, especially the Balkans, than I do. So, and you have, uh, if there is no good literature about this, uh, I think experience and uh, field knowledge, it, it's, it's a really important resource for me. So, I'm really interested in your inputs and experiences and stuff. Well, let's see, are there any questions? I don't know. Many. I, yeah, so I, I do have questions I, and comments. Probably, you know, maybe yeah. if you would like to start, you know, like this, uh, you know, open discussion on this very interesting and fascinating uh, topic. And then probably see if we do have some, um, I keep eyeing that in the chat, you know, there's something, you know, that pops up. Maybe we can yeah. do the round. Yeah. Well, I mean, can you pull the map up again? <laughs> it's a bit blurry I know, a because blurry it's from a was... book that I only have. So, and yeah. I'm wondering if there's more written about this, like in Bulgarian, that I might be able to find for you and and talk about. But but also, I feel like we need to meet in Bulgaria and go travel around those areas because it looks like it's the revival house. If you look at the map. That, mm -hmm. that that upper stripe, it's the Balkan Mountain mm -hmm. kind of area, the sort of revival town. Um, where and then even the lower part, I think that big bomb might be full and get around like it. it. Yeah. And then it's into the Radopi Mountains. Mm -hmm. And the, that Balkan Mountain squad also told me it's where you have a lot of the revival area. I mean it's just the same mm -hmm. word, but meaning nineteenth century <laughs> houses. Um like mid early to mid nineteenth mm -hmm. century, and they're the half timbered, so the bottom mm -hmm. adobe and then the top sort of yeah. projects out, or and it's wood, and they're the two story mm -hmm. ones. And there's you know whole towns of those are like left, or mm -hmm. quite a bit of those left, and they've precisely been revived as sort of Bulgarian national revival, like mm -hmm. that's kind of the part of the rationale around it. But then there's also the Facebook group I told you that I'm on of, it's called, I think, Return to the Village. It's like a Bulgarian Facebook mm -hmm. group. And everyone's precisely buying those kinds of houses and just lovingly fixing them up. But they're also like, oh my God, this has been a nightmare, this project. You know, like, really, <laughs> like, difficult, you know, process. Um, but it seems like kind of an interesting, like, parallel. Hungry. Um, but I would imagine those houses were not just built in the 19th century, but before, because there's also small, like those are kind of the nicer, richer ones. Yeah. These are like merchants, mm -hmm. you know. But then you also see smaller, you know, ones as well. So, um, yeah, so I mean, I wish I knew a little bit more about like how or why, but um, those were built. But it's, I'm just interested in that specific geography of it in the Bulgaria, but. I don't know how complete that is, but you know, it's like those are the those concentrates that at least based on that map. Yeah. That's what I would that's what I would sort of picture there. This yeah. one is from an EU project. Um was mm -hmm. Terra I don't know what some kind of Terra. And uh, <laughs> and uh, uh -huh. It was so it had a regional approach. So yeah. they set up this region I region I mentioned, and then they also zoomed into certain countries, but not in Bulgaria. But Bulgaria, yeah. is, I found uh, a few papers on vernacular architecture. Oh, cool. but, uh, yeah, and those are probably the ones kind of worth saving, like the yes, nicer ones. Yes, yeah. probably where they're focusing the like investment. You know. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, Laura, thank you very much. Just need to say, but I think this is uh, 
really um, something that is a, a very different look from my perspective um, uh, on <laughs> uh, on preserving the dual heritage material and immaterial, uh, which um, I think is kind of an original sort of uh, way to, to look at it. Um, I will have uh, several comments and questions, and then I'll ask, but I'll start with our audience because we already have the first question to you. And it is from Dan Keyes. Thank you, Dan. I'll read it out loud. So uh, he's asking in the Balkans, are there soil mapping efforts which would identify areas where suitable material is more readily available? Mm -hmm. So are you familiar with soil mappings, you know, that might be, you know, uh, identifying the area where actually, you know, it's more mm -hmm. suitable to build those houses? I haven't uh, seen any such research. Mm -hmm. uh, I would be surprised, but, but uh, I mean, who knows? So maybe maybe there is some recent project. I don't know. I, I haven't heard about it. I know that in in uh, in Serbia there is a more intense discourse, or at least they publish, mm -hmm. and uh, they also publish in English. So uh, I found uh, more information on what kind of materials they use uh, from Serbia, but uh, not elsewhere. But uh, thank I you. Well. Thank you, Dan. Uh, right, this down. The answer is yes. Uh, we, we, you know, like uh, Dora hasn't seen it. You know, just make sure because I'm not sure what is that going, what is not. But uh, the answer is uh, uh, no. However, it's a good lead, I think. You know, uh, for Dora to look at. You know, if those could correlate. You know, with um, the maps that we were looking at. Um, Dora, I do, um, as I said, you know, first of all, uh, what I think the book project is actually making it kind of interest and something that I would buy, you know, from, you know, as a political scientist, you know, like, you know, like away from the, the copies that I'm looking at is, first of all, as you mentioned uh, in the beginning of your presentation, a sentence which I have taken down here in Britain, and it says, um, when we think of Europe, you were thinking about, uh, you know, the stereotype of architecture, high architecture, 19th century, different styles, and so on, no one really is thinking about Adobe, Prestard or anything like this. In, in fact, you know, the majority, you know, a lot of people, um, even our students, PhDs, when they go and research, you know, they talk about, you know, the highest styles in Romania, in Central Europe, definitely on the Balkans, you know, uh, but that rarely comes into, into focus and, and, and play. In fact, uh, what you're showing is this long progression, you know, of a knowledge transfer uh, across generations, which actually was the norm <laughs> before, you know, it became so it's kind of like flipping and it's on, on its own head. Uh, from my perspective, it's very interesting, you know, showing how, you know, we came up to, um, you know, this process of gradual learning and just, you know, like building on, on top of it. Now, what I uh, am interested, I don't know, you know, uh, there are two things, you know, which caught my eye in your presentation as well. Uh, one of them is purely from, you know, public administration, political side of things. Uh, and this is the, uh, the convergence of the goals that are set at meta level, that is EU, final goal and so on, very ambitious. EU always wants to be the leader in, in the world, you know, of all those things. And we know how heated the debates are, you know, with the diesels and, you know, like the internal combustion cars and, you know, uh, building certifications for sure, you know, are the, kind of like the scandals of, you know, political scandals because you need to certify certain things and, you know, certain, you know, interest groups are not very, especially big builders uh, to follow. However, um, um, how compatible, you know, are those, uh, instruments is public policy instruments uh, in helping you know this type of revival movement, which obviously has benefits. You know, and you said there are dual benefits, right? Intangible, intangible, uh, and you know, if you look at in this suggestion, you were saying you know, one of your questions is how to compare. You know, um, obviously, you know, uh, just one thing is to look at the regional comparisons, and like nuts, you know, to see Bulgaria and Romania usually get put into one, you know, which is not necessarily fair that might make sense, but to see, you know, EU regulations and how they have affected, you know, you know, this process, mm -hmm. but also how realistic it is, you know, like, uh, 
you know, are mm -hmm. those because you mentioned something quite interesting from my perspective. You said taxation, right? And any type of incentivization, basically the interested parties bear the, the cost and burden. You mm -hmm. know, so if I want to be environmentally conscious, right, it's I have to pay yeah. <laughs> rather than you know, I, you know, to be uh, encouraged. And my second question was, I don't know about that. And is there in this process that you were showing us, you know, like within the revival movement, is there some sort of um, input, you know, or high tech innovation, you know, that can help, you know, like mm -hmm. new technology to be infused in this in order, in order to make it more efficient or mm -hmm. more, uh, mm -hmm. and it's rather lengthy, but I'm excited. Uh -huh. In terms of policies, uh, I think it's it just fits into the trend of generally the adoption of EU policies within this country. So uh, if you think about minority policies or gender policies uh, or any kind of uh, like in terms of uh, social key sort of transfer. Uh, so so what happens to such policies in Romania, in Hungary? So uh, it's like whether whether there is a true identification with these policy goals and uh, so how much effort uh, the state is willing to put into uh, yeah following these goals or whether there is this like negotiation that okay how can we do the minimum mm -hmm. and that it also depends on on uh, uh, well formal and informal institutions that we are discussing at the class now and and. Uh, yeah, so all these uh, different policy systems and traditions within uh, uh, within uh, the the post socialist uh, so sphere. Yeah, so so this is what we saw. So like uh, uh, I did policy research in terms of generally the, re the reuse and adaptation of heritage, uh, and uh, while in Western Europe there are financial tools, policy framework like, which are really supportive in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, often these uh, civic initiatives work uh, like against the rules. So somehow finding this uh, uh, uncovered gray zones where they can still uh, do, do so, do, do what they want or what they believe in. So I think it's it's a part of a general uh, in issue. Approach. Yes, right. yes, <laughs> yes, and. Uh, Concerning the technologies, I think, yes, it can work, but again, it's a matter of uh, priorities that, that uh, like if, if, if there are no uh, resources at all invested into this type of housing and this segment of the population, mm -hmm. then so it's part of social policy too. So I think in this case, heritage, social policy, technology, sustainability, so all these discourses, they, they come together. But I think this is why it's a very interesting topic that, that uh, none works without the other. So th th there is the potential of technologies, uh, but... The reason why yeah. I said it is just, I have glanced somewhere, you know, like in the periphery of my eye, not in Europe. And so I think it was the US, you know, and this revival directly wrong, you know, mm -hmm. the Adobe building, but for instance, adopting um, solar panels or whatever, you yeah. know, like incorporating like really advanced technology into really traditional one, which makes it kind of even more attractive for people to invest into it, buy yeah. into it, um, you know, participate into yes. it, uh, which I would imagine also like the, you mentioned a lot of architects that are mm -hmm. working on this, you know, like innovative architectural solutions, you know, and beyond my limited knowledge yeah. in AutoCAD, you know, like, uh, you know, how to do this, you know, like, yeah. The, the best. yeah, it's interesting for architects and it's interesting for people for whom this is a hobby. But uh, if there is no, uh, no support, no no uh, grants, no finance uh, support, nothing from from uh, this fund mm -hmm. uh, to the owners of such houses. Simply, they cannot cannot afford it. And also because of this, the the uh, market price of such buildings is really cheap. I mean, this was one, also one of the reasons that we thought, okay, let's try this because it's really cheap. It's like one third of brick houses, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I don't know how it is elsewhere in Romania and Hungary for sure. And uh, then, then uh, how much are you willing to invest into a house which 
no matter what you do with it, you cannot sell it for uh, so okay you invest uh, <laughs> yeah, like uh, as much as the the purchase price but then you will never be able to sell it on double price so <laughs> it's, a, it's an expensive hobby to <laughs> play with these houses and uh, frankly this is our dilemma too that okay like we invest time in it and uh, our own physical power working with this mud but then uh, how much you modernize such a building how much do you invest in it uh, it's so it's a policy problem uh, and and the and, and this a combination overlap of different policy areas uh, great I was gonna say I think Craig Campbell had a question sure. Craig do you still have that question, do you still uh, have question? yeah can you hear me okay yes um this actually kind of builds a bit on Kirill's question I think because you know I've, I've been watching the situation in Texas following both rammed earth uh, brick building and then Adobe as well, um, and paying attention to the ways in which um, 3D printing technologies have emerged, these sort of new technologies of house printing, right? Which, if you look at it, really idealizes a world without labor. Um, <laughs> and I think is is like very appealing to venture capital precisely because there's not humans involved, right? And I think venture capital is terrified of labor. Uh, and so what, what we don't see, though, is I think the work that you're doing, which to me is really, really exciting, is asking hard questions about knowledge transfer. Uh, and But aligned with that, I guess I'd be interested to hear more beyond knowledge transfer about social organization, right? So where there was once maybe cohesive villages where you could easily pull together a work party to to build something or fix something, when that's not happening as much anymore, when you have migrations and people moving around, which not only breaks down knowledge transfer, but also breaks down the social cohesion necessary to build a work party. Um, so I, I'm just kind of curious if you have any insight or thoughts about that. Uh, it's interesting. I've also read about this. Uh, uh, basically, these are mobile panels uh, that they produce uh, with industrial technology and then you can just buy it and build your house. But still, you need to know what you can do with this building and you need to understand the local geology that uh, where it is wet and where it is not. And uh, so where the wind comes from. And uh, if you look at this, if you watch this movie, this uh, Stiha, this uh, Ukrainian movie, this, this old people, they tell a lot about uh, why the house was built that way. So, uh, and I think Texas is different in this respect because here the weather is uh, uh, less humid. <laughs> so, uh, so I think there is not that much risk uh, but probably there is another type of risk and hurricanes, or I don't know, I'm not that familiar with it. Uh, yeah, hot, yes. <laughs> I think it's happening more in the West, right, Craig? That kind of building where it's not humid, because on mm -hmm. the coast where you have yes, hurricanes. Yes, maybe, yeah. It's no, very not. humid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, when I yeah. came when I came here, actually, I was shocked that uh, how, so here, it's light, light uh, weight structure, it's not. It does not relate to the price of the property. So in in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, for such houses that are are in Hyde Park, for example, here that would be like Romans live in such houses. And you cannot buy, cannot sell it for. I mean, in terms of materials, you cannot yeah. sell it for for any reasonable amount. So it's it's totally the social, ethnic, uh, financial margins of the society. And here the material of the building. Is not associated that much with the value, so it's an absolutely different way of thinking, and and so I, I was really shocked that our Adobe house here would be a really solid structure, <laughs> and uh, and there it's like oh we are the edge of the village where the suspicious people live. <laughs> well, thank, thank you very much for this uh, yes. question. Oh, oh. oh. Yeah. It's not a question, it's just oh, okay. comment uh, yeah. to, to follow up, uh, and it's related to technologies and also this um, Earth uh, map and so on. So, Dora, this is what I also I learned from you, so that uh, uh, you cannot use any kind of Earth to build it, and you have to know where to dig. And there are two ways to do it. So one way is this really traditional knowledge, then people just work a lot and they can feel the, the clay. 
so mm-hmm. they can they can feel and they know and now probably it's mostly this Roma uh, um, workers who know and another one uh, it's another extreme is that people who work with science so they uh, they analyze soil they do chemical oh, analysis of extreme yeah, and they and they can say that you know they they, they, they don't know about about the region uh, they, they don't have to know uh, but they know how to how to do chemistry so uh, and then they can they can help you to find a good material but it's also a very local knowledge. So uh, there are these uh, companies now, it's enterprises who do this type of renovation and construction, and you can hire them and you like uh, basically construct small construction companies. And uh, still they come to, to your place and then it takes some time for them to learn your area because their knowledge, it's really local. Uh, mm-hmm. they, they If they know, I don't know, uh, North Romania, they know nothing about how to do it in South Romania. Oh. Uh, so just before we continue, because that's important, I think, you know, it relates go back to, to Craig as well. So these people, basically what you're saying, Dora, is they come from another locale, you know, mm-hmm. come to your place, organize the structure, basically, of the, the work, working unit. No, and, they bring people. Oh, they bring people. Okay. And... Who's doing the sampling and so on? And this was kind of lost. You know, like they, 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 know they, to do they the chemistry or, or how, uh, how's that? So, up so some of some of them, even some of them, some companies have people who can do the chemistry, but but uh, those those companies who are organized, so basically they come from villages and they learn mm-hmm. this still uh, from their grandfather, and so so okay, it's it's, so it's almost this almost continuous. They they uh, they can identify that okay, this is probably good, and then they they prepare samples and like when I did this uh, uh, earth plastering, I mixed it. We used old Adobe bricks, but still I prepared the sample and tried it and whether it whether cracks it's or it's cracks sticks, cracks doesn't crack. So and then it's trial and error method. But but for example, we used the uh, old earth uh, adobe bricks, which we got from we transported it by our car from the mm-hmm. nearby region because uh, we just don't know how how else to find material. Well, thank you. Um, um, oh, yeah. Chelsea yeah. is also yeah. Uh, so my question was: so you talked about the benefits of of, of these uh, earth houses are, and I don't know if you sampled it or not. I mean, it would be from places possibly like the uh, Bulgarian form Dr. Nuber talked about, but are people building because of those reasons? Because when I hear return to the village and traditionalism, like traditionalism with or without the capital T in Central and Eastern Europe can be kind of a dangerous fringe ideology. So when you talk about returning to this tradition, um, are there are there ties in beyond the benefits um, that are difficult to actually address uh, in these kind of spaces? Mm-hmm. There, are, so there are still people who are building because it's cheap. So uh, it's it's a uh, as I said typically Roma communities use this, but uh, yeah. Uh, also in the Danube, uh, that uh, they do this because it's it's the I just saw a documentary now on this that that uh, this is the best material uh, because they know how to to use it so that it's not sinking uh, because of the the, the um, soil, but. Uh, now, so those who, who who are in the revival movement and they renovate such houses or they 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 are all part of the heritage discourse in a certain way. So so it's not just uh, and it's not, and it's not a national or national. It's not a folk architecture heritage discourse. Yeah, there are also this kind of interests. You know that that let's uh, get. Uh, this uh, instruments like old agricultural instruments and put them on the wall so it has a special aesthetics but mm-hmm. this is just one type of aesthetics but then uh, so uh, in this movie in this uh, ukrainian documentary they they showed how people work differently with such houses so so some people totally adapted to modern uh, lifestyle like these urban nomads and uh, some people uh, Start to wear these four costumes and you know, the tradition of it. So they have there is a broad range of how people can relate to this type of heritage and how heritage is made through this relationship. And I think this is really exciting that 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 uh, this diversity that that uh, exactly because it's not formalized. So there is no monument office who says that 
this is heritage preserved. It's like these people have the freedom to interact with tangible and intangible heritage. Um, I think Chelsea had a question. Yes. And then, then we can go to you. Chelsea, you want to go ahead? Hi. Hi. Um, thanks for this talk, Dora. I have a lot of questions I want to follow up with you because I'm teaching my class this fall for the first time. I think I maybe told you it's called Heritage and Hate. And it's uh that is in reference to the Confederacy. Um, and so in the class I'm bringing like um Southeast Europe and the Southern United States, mostly Southeast United States, into conversation around these topics. So I have lots of questions. Um, but one I was thinking about as you were just talking. In the last 20 minutes, and forgive me if you already addressed this, because I had to step away for a bit um, for a call, um, and I'm really sorry about that. So I missed a little bit. I've been thinking about the ways that um, that state socialism, that communism are thought of in terms of heritage or not, like a rejected past, but not necessarily embraced as a heritage, but the ways that physical markers, like so in Albania, the ways that what were prominent factories are there, but they're not necessarily um, utilized or, or they're no longer factories where anyone works. And in these barracks tend to house a lot of Roma and Egyptian families, either informally because they've moved to those areas and they've done so the last 30 years, or because they're these kind of temporary housing um, spaces turned more permanent. And I guess I was just really curious in thinking about these kinds of buildings and structures in relationship to heritage and and I guess just kind of broadly too thinking about like a heritage, like a socialist heritage. And 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 maybe that goes in hand in hand with the various forms of of memory and nostalgia um and how they're shifting when it comes to you know socialism today, like in the Balkans. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it's it's a it's a bit similar uh situation to this kind of folk heritage that on one hand there is an industrial heritage discourse also in central and eastern europe that uh, there are uh, sites which are selected as heritage so somebody says that this is heritage and uh, they are listed and sometimes protected sometimes they don't really know what to do with them but uh, then there is the other understanding of heritage that that uh, when when uh, when we are looking at how people connect to and interact with certain uh, tangible and intangible assets, uh, in this case, with this uh, industrial uh, buildings, landscapes, and uh, there is also a discourse on that. So, and also there is, so when we talk about heritage protection so conservation and uh, presentation it's not the only way to deal with it because it becomes heritage because it has a meaning so we attribute the value to it and the meaning is generated and this like different types of meanings are generated by different types of interactions like exactly what you said that these communities move into the sites and they interact with it and it's it's absolutely meaningful, just a different way from. So I think it's 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 an interesting project to to examine to analyze their understanding of the space and the material environment they inhabit and what do they know about the stories connected to that, and uh, and how these narratives relate to the majority. Uh, unofficial and official majority narrative. So in heritage studies, we call authorized heritage discourse, the official discourse, which is represented by the state and institutions. And we call subaltern heritage discourses, uh, those which are the, the alternative discourses of different types of communities. And of course, these discourses compete, contest each other. So heritage is always dissonant in this respect so yeah but we have a book with vladimir we edited a book on uh, industrial heritage and post-socialist uh, countries so i can send you the link there are some papers which uh yeah where the authors discuss this issue yeah i'd appreciate that thank you and then at some point maybe we should have a copy because i'd also love to talk with you about plantations in um the south i don't know if, had, if you've had the chance to go to any um but formerly in uh, slavery plantations. And um, just curious. Okay. I would love to. I haven't been to, but I would love to. <laughs>
And then I think you have a question. Was there a question down here somewhere? Oh, yeah. I, so I feel a little out of place here. No, I'm not. So out of place. Place. I am out of place. Yes. <laughs> no one is out of place. No. This is walking circle then. Uh, hi, my name is Marina. Um, I'm a freshman. Um, I guess I came because I've had some long-standing interest in Earth and Homes. Uh, I mean, honestly, the most I've done is I've read a couple of books on it. So uh, y'all probably, if you know about this, have heard of The Hand Sculpted House. That was like the book that I started on for, for this sort of information. And I've just been kind of like, you know, learning a bit here and there. My mom is from Montenegro and um, the house that she grew up in was a cob house. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I don't know. I was like, I was amazed that you guys were talking about something so niche that I somehow applied to. So I was like, I'll go, I'll go. And so I came here. And anyway, uh, this feels like a bit of a naive question. And maybe you already covered this and I just missed it. But I'm a little confused as to on the map, it seems like all the Cobb homes uh, in the Balkans, or I suppose earthen homes generally in the Balkans, seem to be not on the coast for whatever reason. Um, or at least that's how it appeared to me. My vision is a little bad. Um, and uh, and I was just wondering, like, like, is that like a problem with data, uh, like, like getting the data for those regions, or is it a problem with like, like, like the soil in the area? Like, why was that? Uh, so on the map, uh, I am trying to share it, but uh, I'm lost in my. And I should clarify again, my yeah, vision is here. bad. I just saw that the part was blank, yeah. you know, and yeah. so. Uh -huh. So uh, first of all, this area is not covered because this was an EU funded project focusing on EU countries. Uh -huh. uh, so they write a little bit in the regional uh, overuse about these areas, but. Uh, Croatia yeah. also. And uh, yeah. Is Croatia a newer EU? Like, how old? Me, yeah, oh, yeah, so, yeah I think this one, oh, bit, yeah, yeah, this one uh, was yeah, some time ago. What is some data? Uh -huh. In Croatia, they have lots of stones. I think they, they just don't. Uh, don't I think they, they probably they do because there is a lot of stone in Greece as well, and they, they still do it. So even if there is stone, they often form, combine it with uh, clay and earth. So I think it's probably the problem of data. Okay. But this is uh, where I started with that it's really difficult to find any data because uh, because if it's not declared as heritage, then people in seismology, working with seismology are interested in this thing. Mm -hmm. But most of like in most areas, nobody is interested in this. So uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a good one. You know, just a question, you know, um, it just occurred to me something. I was looking at the western part of or just a commentary, not a question, rather. Um, is there a some sort of a systematic Cadaster or 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 registry or Riestra or you know for Western Europe because I'm looking at Spain right I'm looking at France and then Germany and it seems that you do have a data you know like mm -hmm. what, it, it's, how is this done you know like do you know like by surveying by mm -hmm. within this project do you know how they gather uh, the data for that? I, uh... They they didn't do surveys for this project, but there are countries. For example, in Serbia, there is a there is an atlas of Serbia and rural architecture, okay. and they cover different regions. And they they so there are quite uh, good data for for my purposes as a starting point. But uh, in uh, like in Austria, it's it's uh, it's only. The eastern area where there is significant, uh, I think it's Remdurs or Adobe architecture. It's mm -hmm. it's a wine region, and they mm -hmm. so that one was uh, was they started a crowdsourcing project to collect information. Again, it's not complete, so it's really diverse, and it depends on the purpose of inventory. So why why people were interested in understanding or mapping up the rural architecture? So. I it, from from the publication of the, the website a typical for you project after ten years the website is dead so I cannot find any of their reports where they actually explain where the data come from and in the final output the book there is no no information about I, the source of data. The methodology because if you look at uh, also what I found interesting is just in relation with our uh, newcomer here and hopefully we'll see you know on more more circles. Uh, is if you look at the coastal Scotland, and because uh, you know I used to live in Aberdeen, and I'm looking at you know the there, and uh, and I'm looking at um, Ireland as well. Um, 
it means that you know the survey you know like the stone hypothesis and it this is like the stoniest you know places I can think of <laughs> and yet you know so it means that um just the thought you know just to you know I'll also try to think you know like uh, at least with the Bulgarian sources you know like uh, where such information might be available or how to serve it. I was just thinking methodologic wise, you know, methodology wise, you know, like if the Western Europe has some ideas of how they've gathered all of this, you know, like in order, you know what I mean? You know, how yeah. to approach it, you know, like yeah. if you're saying that it's incomplete data and I completely understand because it's probably, as you said, you know, the project is there and then you know, the site goes down and you know but this doesn't mean that those areas which are colored they are they have good data from there it means that somebody looked at it and there they found what a lot and architecture so oh, this I doesn't see. indicate okay. that in from hungary we have a complete knowledge due to some housing statistics and uh, and there are 600 like a uh yeah, that that uh, six hundred seventy thousand buildings, mm -hmm. and in uh, Scotland there are five uh, North Scotland. I don't, there are five co buildings which are protected heritage. So this doesn't show this map. Okay, uh, okay, okay. It, this is about the the where they detected certain uh, technologies. Mm -hmm. It's a it was a really heavy task. <laughs> no. I, I will not be able to come up with. Uh, and this is not even my aim to come up with a complete survey because I am interested more in the discourses and narratives and interactions. But I need this type of knowledge to understand where to start my my own project. Yeah. Um. I don't, I mean I don't know. Are there any other questions? I had one other comment. It's sort of what I said before, but I thought more about it <laughs> because also I did write a book once on these, or a book, sorry, an article once on the revival houses in Bulgaria, but not, there's some architectural perspective, but it's, it's actually more from a perspective of sort of marriage and how to mm -hmm. perceive. Um, and which I can share with you. I mean, it's not earth shattering or anything, but <laughs> but one thing that I talk about there is how in the parts of the Balkans that were under the Ottoman Empire, um, or the parts of Eastern Europe that were under the Ottoman Empire, there was more of a tendency to knock down all that Ottoman architecture. Mm -hmm. And like once these became, you know, nation states, post-Ottoman states. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the states of East Central Europe, they didn't feel a need to knock down Austro-Hungarian architecture because they could just decide it was Czech now in Hungary. Mm -hmm. They could just or in Croatia, they didn't need to knock down Italian architecture. Mm -hmm. They could just call it Croatian. <laughs> um, but in the Balkans, when it's blatantly mosques and you know sort of Ottoman mm -hmm. architecture, there was much more of a need to knock it down and start over. And as a result, there's not as much of a sort of architectural heritage and certainly not a European looking mm -hmm. architectural heritage that they can look to. And as a result, these kind of revival area, which are era um, houses, which are half timber, but are, you know, like Adobe and stuff, are much more, I guess, a focus on mm -hmm. this idea of architectural heritage and like, you know, there's the open air museums and then there's mm -hmm. the, even parts of town, you know, whole quarters of towns. Even if in reality those were mixed areas where Greeks lived and other, you know others, it's like this is the Bulgarian revival like neighborhood. So there was a much more of a need to have those be kind of central to mm -hmm. the, having a kind of usable material past that's architectural and that's uniquely Bulgarian. So mm -hmm. it, it seems to me like different in that way mm -hmm. from other parts of East Central Europe. Yes, uh, I think. Uh... In the socialist era, there was this uh, search for natural, natural, national heritages in uh, different countries. And uh, the, so I think this is the reason why Skansens are so popular there, because uh, like the heritage of the people, this vernacular architecture, it was a genre that so this, this type of ethnography that exists in Central and Eastern Europe is very specific. And uh, so I think, yes, there are this, this uh, national heritageization uh, processes, and this is the reason why certain segments survive this heritage. Yeah, like yes, yeah. But I, I think I think the 
So that uh, segment of Earth architecture, which is not heritage officially, but people just use it and uh, live with it. That's so, so I think somehow I would like to work with that area where this happens, mm -hmm. but it's, I, I can see I can see a core of this area like Hungary, Romania, Serbia. This is what I know. Like my this this area organized around myself, mm -hmm. but then uh, where it goes, how far it goes, I'm still uncertain about that. Uh, so whether in Bulgaria this is just heritage with a I don't know listed and with some sign on it, or is it uh, preserved heritage? Is it preserved heritage, or is it a living heritage, a lived heritage where uh, people don't even think about it in terms of heritage. I think there's probably both, both mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, but yeah, it's, it's something I'd like to look into more, like this. It's really okay. fun, interesting topic, so yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Thank you very much. Are there that. other questions? Okay. Well, from the Zoom? No. Okay. Well, thank you very much. This was really interesting. I like having brought together all these different approaches and made us all think more about this topic. And it's really exciting. I want to learn. I want to learn more. Thank you for the questions and comments. And now I am really scared of it. <laughs> what a complex thing I'm jumping into. What they told me what we're going to say. Well, um, thank you for all of you that you know have showed up in person uh, on this Friday afternoon. Uh, our Zoom fan club, thank you for coming.